Hello and thank you everyone who is joining me today. I'm Gracie and this talk is about frogs in the human world. How we can use citizen science data, in this case data from the Frog ID project, to uncover the secrets of species survival. So this talk is based on my PhD research which I'm doing through the Australian Museum and UNSW Sydney. It should come as no surprise that human-driven habitat modification negatively affects global biodiversity. So it can lead to population declines, species extinctions, and it can drastically change species assemblages. Human-modified environments are often really tricky places for species to live in because there are all sorts of selective pressures. Land is cleared and fragmented, there are introduced species, artificial structures, and often really high levels of noise, light, and chemical pollution. So if we are to conserve biodiversity within these landscapes, it's really important that we understand how species respond to habitat modification. Unfortunately, though, this information is lacking for certain groups of animals, frogs in particular. In Australia, we are lucky to have such a wonderful diversity of frog species. We have over 240 native frog species and almost all of them are found nowhere else in the world. But Australia's frogs are in trouble. When you look at the status of Australia's frogs, four species are already extinct, 15 species are critically endangered and 37 species are threatened. So that's about one in six of our frog species. Globally, frogs are also in trouble. 42% of all amphibian species, which obviously includes frogs, are threatened with extinction. And this is likely due to a combination of introduced species, climate change, illegal wildlife trade, disease, pollution, and most of all, habitat loss and degradation. So frog responses to habitat modification are pretty poorly understood. Most of what we know comes from small community level studies that are often very spatially restricted with only a few species. A lot of them use different, often region specific measures of habitat modification. So it's quite difficult to compare between studies. And a lot of them have been conducted in North America and Europe, and they're quite biased towards pond breeding species. So what we really need is to have macroecological analyses, you know, but to do this, we need a lot of data. And in the past, this would have been very difficult to obtain, but this is really where citizen science holds a lot of power. So the goal of my research was to use large scale citizen science data from Frog ID to find out how frogs are responding to human driven habitat modification. I wanted to know do Australia's frog species tolerate habitat modification? And if so, how well? I also wanted to know which traits facilitate species persistence in modified habitat. The goal is ultimately to be able to predict which species are likely to persist and which are likely to decline in modified environments so that we can make targeted conservation interventions. So what is the Frog ID data set? What does it actually look like? The Frog ID is all about putting Australia's frogs on the map and using this information to inform their conservation. So it's a national citizen science project that's based on the audio recordings of frogs. And we have access to a huge volume of data. We've got hundreds and thousands of calls. Each green dot on the map there represents a recording that has been submitted by a citizen scientist. And over 80% of Australia's frog species are represented in this data set. For those of you who are unfamiliar with how Frog ID works, it's a free app that you can download onto your smartphone. Essentially, whenever you hear a frog calling, you just make a 20 to 60 second recording of it and a frog expert from the Australian Museum will listen to it and you'll get notified of all the frog species that are calling in your recording. On the back end of things, we get access to date, time and location metadata. And this is really important for my research because my research is on anthropogenic habitat modification, so obviously I need to be able to quantify that. So to do that, I use a publicly available global data set. This one is the Global Human Modification Index. The darker the purple, the more modified the area. So this index accounts for five major human stresses, human settlement, agriculture, transport, mining, mining and energy production, and electrical infrastructure. Now we can take a look at how this index looks in New South Wales. Um, as you can see, the modification range 
index ranges from zero, which is not very modified, to one which is very modified. So there's a nice gradient of values even across New South Wales from pretty much zero in the outback to one in the city. So now we can take each frog ID observation and give it a modification score. So we do this for every species with more than 100 records from unique locations. We ended up with over 126,000 records and we use this to quantify each species response to habitat modification. So the process is the same for each species. So let's just use a striped marsh frog as an example. We first, let's take a look at the species range there in green. We took all the observations of the striped marsh frog and determined how those observations were distributed across the modification gradient. And that's what you see in the density plot there. So then we took the median, which is the red line there, which we call the species median. It's about 0.7. That indicates about 50% of individuals of this species lives in areas less modified than this and 50% live in areas more modified than this. Next, we wanted to know how modified um, this species range was in general. So we took all the records of all species within the striped marsh frogs range. So that's all observations of the striped marsh frogs and any other species within its range. And we again looked at how they were distributed across the modification gradient, and we took the median value. So that's that gold line that you see there, that's a geographic range median. We then took the difference between the species median and the range median, which we call the relative modification score. And this essentially tells us out of all the habitat that is available to a species, does it generally prefer to live in modified habitats or does it prefer to live in less modified habitats? So here are a few more example species. Species with a negative modification index where the red line is to the left of the yellow line as shown in the top row there, tend to occur in relatively unmodified habitats within its geographic range. So they're pretty intolerant of human-driven habitat modification. Now those on the bottom there with a positive modification index tend to occur in modified areas within its range. So they're generally quite tolerant of habitat modification. So the larger the positive value, the more tolerant the species. So in the case of this graph here, um, the most tolerant species is the striped marsh frog. So now we know the process of calculating the index, let's find out who the winners and the losers are. So species responses can really be summed up by this graph. Don't be alarmed by the scientific names. The key point here is that we calculated an index for 87 frog species. Those were the over 100 records. This is about 36% of Australia's frog species. An index of zero, which is that black line there, indicates that a frog is neither tolerant nor intolerant of habitat modification. But anything to the right of this line with a positive modification index, these are the species that are tolerant. Anything to the left of the black line with a negative index, these are the species that are intolerant. One of the most salient results here is that 70% of the species we examined were negatively affected by habitat modification, which is an alarmingly high percent. So clearly habitat loss is a really significant threat to Australia's frogs. We also think that this is likely to be a conservative estimate because a lot of the species that we couldn't analyse because we didn't have enough data were range-restricted habitat specialists that are probably even more sensitive to habitat modification. So let's put a face to the names here are the top five most intolerant frogs. I'll talk a little bit more about why this might be the case later. And here are the winners, the top five most tolerant frogs. So the winners here, if you're a Sydney sighter, you might be familiar with number one, the striped marsh frog. It's call cool, sounds like a dripping tap or microwave popcorn. Um, those in WA might have heard of the motorbike frog, which is number three. I have to play the call because it is excellent. But the top five here are all really frequently recorded in suburban backyards. Among the winners, um, several including number five, the graceful tree frog, have successfully formed breeding populations in towns outside their native range, thanks to being stowaways in fruit boxes. So our index is generally an accurate and practical tool for urban planners who want to assess the impact of development. So now while no doubt we want to be able to consider species specific responses in conservation planning, it is also really helpful to understand broad trait based trends so that we can identify priority species or groups 
especially species where there isn't enough data for us to derive a modification index. And this is why we looked at the traits which predict tolerance. So for every species in our data set, we looked at a range of ecological and life history traits, as you can see on the screen there. Now, because there was some evidence that species responses to habitat modification were related to their phylogenetic or their evolutionary relationships, we ran a model that accounted for phylogeny and one that didn't. Across all the models, the strongest and the most consistent relationships were for geographic range size and generalism. So species that were tolerant of anthropogenic modification were typically generalists with small geographic range sizes. So studies have often found generalists to be more successful than specialists in disturbed environments. They're more likely to tolerate a broad range of environmental conditions, including those in modified habitats. So it makes sense you know, that they do well across the board in all sorts of habitats. In terms of geographic range, we think this result might be due to um, not having enough range restricted species in our data set. But a species degree of specialism is one of the few consistent and useful markers of persistence in human environments. Tolerant species also often displayed low frequency or low pitched calls, which was surprising because species are often documented calling at a higher pitch in response to low pitch traffic noise. But this trend might be driven in part by body size in that larger frogs often have lower pitched calls. So in terms of size, we found um, a bit of mixed evidence um, so these contrasting results might be driven by separate processes. So on one hand, body size is positively re related to dispersal abilities. So larger, more mobile species might be able to acquire resources better in modified and fragmented habitats, so they do quite well. But on the other hand, large body size is often associated with a slow life history. So long lifespan, delayed maturity, so populations are often slower to recover after environmental disturbances. Species that call from vegetation were also generally really modification tolerant, and species with terrestrial cultures were often intolerant. The species with terrestrial cultures often depend on forest resources, so think like damp leaf litter for egg laying, so they might not persist in modified habitats which have much fewer of these resources. So this indicates that frog diversity could be supported through two complementary strategies. One is preserving the natural habitat we have left, and two is creating urban green spaces and frog friendly gardens with plenty of native vegetation. So the take home message is that most of Australian frog species are intolerant of human driven habitat modification, in particular specialists. And we really need to consider the human impacts to ensure the long term persistence of frog populations. And that citizen science is a valuable tool that we can leverage to understand how species respond to anthropogenic habitat modification. So that brings me to the end of my talk. If you want to find out more, this research is available online. Just scan the QR code. Um, I've linked the free version here, but you can also access the official version via this link too. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone for sticking it out to the end, and I'm happy to take any questions.